In this lecture, we'll discuss dynamic vibration absorbers, sometimes called tune mass dampers. And the idea is that we have a mass spring system and say a motor is running on top of this and that motor has an imbalance. And so as a result, it imparts a force of F sub zero e to the i omega t, some sort of harmonic force to this mass spring system. And when this uh, omega starts to approach the natural frequency of the system, we get a very big response. In other words, these amplitudes get very, very big, and um, in many cases, they're undesirable. So the idea is, is we can model this as a simple harmonic oscillator where we know from our past experience that this simple harmonic oscillator has a natural frequency and we'll call this natural frequency omega sub 1 and omega sub 1 is equal to the square root of k1 over m1 and so the idea is is that omega is approximately equal to omega 1 and what's happening is we're getting some very big, big vibrations and what we'd like to do is use a mass spring system, in other words, attach an auxiliary mass spring system to this in order to reduce it, in order to reduce the response. So here I've drawn that. We've got this mass spring system of mass M2 and stiffness K2 that we attach to the, prim the uh, primary mass. And we would like to tune it in such a way that when the system is operating, it helps to reduce the displacement of, of mass 1. So in other words, mass 2 will start to vibrate, and in doing so, it will suck the kinetic energy out of the system, or it will take the kinetic energy from mass 1, and uh, mass 2 will move in its place. So if I show you the uh, equivalent model of that, all that we've done is we've taken the simple harmonic oscillator, and we've added this down at the bottom. And so we would expect now it's a 2 degree of freedom system, and we're going to have frequencies omega 1. Uh, whoops. I'll just say we'll have two uh, natural frequencies. Where obviously, in the case of the simple harmonic oscillator, we just had one natural frequency. So stated differently, what we want to do is we want to add a degree of freedom to the system so that we can take the natural frequency as it exists and convert it into two natural frequencies, both of which are different from this frequency omega, which is the frequency at which the uh, forcing function is being applied, or the frequency of oscillation of the motor. Oops. All right, so I've drawn this two degree of freedom system on the right. Uh, of course, we've got this applied load F zero e to the I omega t being applied to the top mass. That's the uh, harmonic load due to the motor. And we've got some mass here, M2 and stiffness K2. So we've turned it into a two degree of freedom problem. And I should be able to go ahead and just state the equations of motion for you here. I've certainly shown enough examples of this. Uh, if this is unclear for any reason, go back to the two degree of freedom system. Um, there's a link to it above here. You can click on that. But these are the equations of motion. And what we're trying to do is solve it for the steady state solution. So mathematically, we're looking for the particular solution rather than the homogeneous solution to the set of equations. And I'm going to number these equations one and two. And We've seen this for the single degree of freedom system with generalized forcing. Uh, I'm going to do the equivalent. Again, the link is up above if you want to go and have a look how we did that. Um, but what we did is we assumed a response of the form. In this case, it's a two degree of freedom system. So X sub J is equal to capital X sub J um, e to the I omega T. So you might remember from previous videos that when there's no damping in the system, there's no phase shift between the forcing, the forcing function and the response of the system.
So we assume a forcing function, uh, a response to be the same harmonic nature as the forcing function. And of course, in this case, j equals 1 and 2, your 2 degrees of freedom. All right, so applying 3 to equations 2 and 1, 3 to equation 1, first of all, gives us, um, when I take the second derivative of x, I'm actually multiplying by minus omega squared. So let me write it here, minus omega squared uh, m times big X1 uh, plus K1 capital X1 plus K2 into capital X1 minus X2 is equal to F0. And I've cancelled from both sides the e to the I omega T. This would be equation 4. Okay, And then substituting 3 into 2, that's very simply m2, or minus omega squared, m2, x2 double dot, just gives us an x2, and then plus k2, x2 minus x1. And that's equal to 0. And this is equation 5. So I'm going to rewrite this in matrix form. And that looks like this implies uh, k1 plus k2. This is from this equation here. k1 times x1, k2 times x1 minus omega m squared minus omega, this should be m1, m1 squared, excuse me, omega squared m1, and k2, minus k2, this is also minus k2, and this is k2 minus omega squared m2, that's all a matrix, and that multiplies the vector x1, x2, and that's equal to, we'll just write it in there, f0 and 0. And this is equation 6. All right, now what I can do is I can call this matrix here z. That's known as the impedance matrix. However, I'd like to rewrite this equation in the form of uh, solve it for x. Because in other words, I, I would like to see what the response x is, or the uh, magnitude, the amplitude of the response x is, because that's what we're trying to reduce. Specifically, the amplitude x1 we want to minimize. So, uh, this equation above is in the form of some matrix Z times some vector X, we'll call it, is equal to some forcing vector F. And I'd like to write this in the form of X is equal to Z inverse, the inverse of the impedance matrix times F. And then I have my response. So we'll call this equation 7 and equation 8. So turning the page, what I've done is I've gone ahead and copied the uh, matrix Z. That's the matrix that we're trying to invert. And also equation 8. This is equation 8. All right, and let me, by way of a slight digression here, refresh you about how we solve the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. So let's just write that digression. This is something you should be familiar with, but maybe you've forgotten. Uh, if I've got a matrix Z that has components Z, 1, 1, 
Z21, Z12, but due to symmetry, this is also Z21. And then this would be Z22. Whoops. I'll remind you here that Z21 is equal to Z12. Right? Then the inverse can be written. Let me make sure we realize it's a matrix by putting brackets around it. So the inverse of Z is 1 divided by, whoops, 1 divided by the determinant of Z times the following matrix. The diagonal terms get switched around, Z22, Z11, and the off-diagonal terms get a negative sign. Uh, what do we call it? Z21 and negative Z21. Okay, and then oh, let me write where, what is the determinant of Z? The determinant of Z of this is the product of the diagonals, Z11 times Z22, minus the product of the off-diagonals. That would be minus Z21 squared, since Z12 and Z21 are the same. All right, and then specifically, um, if I did z to the minus 1 times f, which in our case is f, f sub 0 and 0, this is equal to uh, z to 2, uh, let me do it slightly differently. I'll leave the 1 over determinant of z. And we know what the determinant of z is. It's, whoops, this whole expression for the determinant of z. And that is multiplied by the following vector. And all I've done is I've multiplied z by f0, f0 and 0. So it's z2, 2 times f0 minus z2, 1 times 0. That cancels. And then in the bottom line, we have minus z21 times f0. All right, so this would be equation 9. This is equation 10. This is equation 11. So from equation 11, we can go back to equation 8, and we can write this as, well, exactly what we have there. So x1, x2, let's put the little bars on here, is equal to 1 divided by the determinant of matrix Z times, write it as a vector rather, Z22 two two times F0 and minus Z21 times f zero okay and if I expand all this out bearing in mind we know what z21 and z22 are we know what the determinant is because we have this matrix z here this is equal to the denominator would be the magnitude of z which we've said is uh, z11 times z22 so z11 is k1 plus k2 minus omega squared m1. That is multiplied by z22, which is k1 minus omega squared m2. And we've got to subtract from that the product of the other diagonals, which is just k squared, excuse me, k2 squared. And what's in the numerator? So this is the case of x1. And the numerator is z22 times f0. Well, Z22 is K1, excuse me, that shouldn't be K1, that should be a K2. I made a mistake when I copied that. You just look on the previous page to confirm that. This is a K2 here. All right? I just made that correction. K2 minus omega squared M2. So this should be K2 minus omega squared M2. 
m2 times f sub 0. We'll call that equation 10. And that is the response or the amplitude of the response of mass 1. Similarly, we can do the same thing for response x2. And that's equal to, it's the same thing except it's minus z21 in the numerator. And minus z21 is plus k2. Okay, so this just looks like k2 times f0 divided by oh, that same denominator, k1 plus k2 minus omega squared m1 k2. I'm going to need to make that change there. That was the same error I made before. k2 minus omega squared m2 minus k2 squared. Whoops, that's equation 11. Right, and then what I showed you in the single degree of freedom case for generalized harmonic loading of a single degree of freedom system, we non-dimensionalized this. And the way we did it is we defined a static deflection, delta sub st, and that was equal to F0 divided by K1. Remember, that's in terms of the original system. We're truly only concerned, really concerned about mass 1. That's the focus here. Mass 1 is, uh, was there initially, and there was a static deflection we could define on that basis that says, uh, if this was not a harmonic load, we would expect mass 1 to displace by an amount of F0 divided by K1. That's equation 12. We also defined omega 1 squared, or we just call it omega 1 is equal to the square root of k1 over m1. This was initially the, the fundamental, the only degree of freedom was root k1 over m1, where we had the single mass, m1. And then mass 2 has its own natural frequency we'll define as k2 over m2 which would be, again, assuming that mass 2 were treated and isolated and treated just like a simple harmonic is isolator, a sim simple harmonic oscillator. I'm getting tongue-tied here. All right, so if I just consider mass 1 and spring 1, that has a frequency I'm going to call omega 1. And if we just consider mass 2 and, and stiff, uh, spring 2, that has an angular frequency omega 2. And now what do we know? We know that omega is approximately equal to omega 1. Why do we know that? Because we're getting very big responses. We're getting very big responses because the frequency of the loading is roughly equal to the natural frequency of the mass spring system. Okay. So what I'm going to do is using equations 12, 13, and 14, I'm going to rewrite 10 and 11 in dot, in dot, in non-dimensional terms. Okay, and again, we saw this in the generalized loading of a single harmonic oscillator. I explained that mechanical engineers often like to non-dimensionalize their equations because it allows them to, to solve it for a whole family of problems instead of just a specific problem. All right, and I'll show you the form of these equations, the non-dimensional form on the next page. I'll leave it as an exercise to you to see if you can figure it out, how to get from 10 and 11 to what's going to be 15 and 16. But you will need to use these substitutions to get there. So turning the page, what I've done is I've gone and rewritten these, these equations in non-dimensional form. There's no magic here. It's just a little bit of algebra, but uh, since I didn't want you all tuning out why I did that, um, I have done it in a previous video. And if you'd really like to see me do this, leave the comments below. But uh, fundamentally, in non-dimensional terms, I can write the ratio of the dynamic amplitude to the static deflection, which we've shown in a previous video, is also the amplification factor. And the link is above here. I can write it in this non-dimensional form should be very easy to see that if I'm trying to minimize the response x1 or minimize the amplification factor on the response f1, uh, x1, I just need to minimize the numerator. And that happens when omega is equal to omega 2. So if omega is equal to omega 2, this implies 
that x1 of a delta static equals zero. Well, what does that mean exactly? We know that omega 1 and omega are fairly similar. That's why we're getting this big response in the single degree of freedom's case. Right? Initially, we had some uh, applied load at a frequency of omega. It was very close to omega 1. So if omega is equal to omega 2, we can then say that that's also equal to omega 1. So the idea is if we want to minimize or we want to make sure the response x1 is 0, we pick an auxiliary mass and spring that has the same frequency as omega 1, which is the same as omega. So what that means... Uh, what's this, 17, 18. What that means is omega is equal to omega 1, which is equal to omega 2, which is omega equal to uh, root k over m, k1 over m1, which is equal to root k2 over m2. So in order to tune our mass damper, all we need to make sure is that M2, excuse me, K2 over M2 is equal to K1 over M1. If that relationship holds, relationship 19, what we find is that at the operating frequency of the motor, X1 is actually zero. It's perfectly tuned and all the kinetic energy goes into mass 2 and none of it goes into mass 1 at all. That's a pretty cool result. So fundamentally, we typically have mass 2. Mass 2 is much, much less than mass 1. This also implies that the stiffness K2 is much, much less than K1. So the question then are, remains, what is the displacement x2? And I'll do this on the same page. If omega equals omega 1 equals omega 2, then from equation 16, that becomes that x2 over delta static is equal to minus k1 over k2. Why is that? Because this becomes 0. This term here becomes 0. Therefore, the denominator is just negative k2 over k1, and it's the inverse of that. Right, so I could rewrite this as this implies that x2 is equal to, remember that delta static is just equal to f0 over k1. So if I plug that in for delta static, I get that this is negative f0 over k2. Well, that is really saying that x2 times k2 is equal to minus f. So the force uh, by spring number 2, spring number 2 applies a force that is just equal to negative f0. It exactly cancels out the force by the motor. This is why the displacement is 0 of mass number 1. So again, this spring is applying a force in that direction equal to F0. And that's what cancels out the applied load. All right, back to where we were. And the final thing is maybe you're restricted by how much displacement X2 can have. So let's write X2 in this form. Um, what is this? This is equation 20. We could rewrite x2 as x2, by the way, these are all capital x2s. I haven't put all the capitals on here, but it should be implied. Um, this is the amplitude. x2 is equal to negative f0 over k2. We know that from above. But we know that k2 is just omega squared m2. So this is minus f0 over omega squared m2. So what does that mean? That means that if we've got some restriction on the distance f, this shows us how heavy the mass needs to be, if that makes sense. So the, the bigger the mass is, the less that x2 is going to be.
All right. And I want to just end this video by graphing these functions, function 15 and 16, versus what the response of the system looked like before. And I haven't written that here, but we've seen that in a previous video. Uh, that is just the amplification factor of a single degree of freedom system. So what I've done is I've prepared for you on the next page a plot that I did, which demonstrates this. Let me just give this some axes. Um, on the x-axis, we have r, which is equal to omega divided by omega 1. And on the vertical axis, we have x1, the amplitude x1 divided by the static effect. So that's the magnification factor. Okay? This is the magnification factor, and this is the frequency. And the blue curve is showing you what we had initially. When we hit a frequency omega 1, this magnification factor got uh, infinite and it blew up. And we had very big displacements. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to add a secondary mass. And what that did is it turned it into a two degree of freedom system and effectively moved these frequencies away from r equals 1. So we had one here at about 0.85 and another one here at about 1.15. Um, but interestingly, if we follow this green line, it's all the way down at zero here. You can't really see it because it coincides the axis. But fundamentally, the green curve, when the frequency is at omega-1, which is the frequency that we believe this, this motor is going to be operating at, we have zero amplitude. Well, this video got a little bit long. I, I'm sorry it ran away from itself a little bit, but uh, I hope you found something interesting in it. I'd love to hear from you if you have any comments down below. Um, if you found you learned something useful, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Or better still, why don't you subscribe to the channel and you'll be notified of all future video releases. Thank you for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.